See you through, and so you shall be seen through, and into, and around, and about, and everywhere. That's pretty much what the lessons are about today. Uh, the promise that uh, God always makes, uh, and I mentioned it to you last week, that uh, the promise that he makes coming from Martin Luther primarily is one of his code code sentences, where there is charity and love, there is God. And that's precisely why Peter is getting asked those questions by Jesus again and again and again. Uh, for one thing you know, there's just a week or so going on now between uh, Jesus' resurrection uh, and the crucifixion and the, and the night he was arrested at, in Gethsemane and the Lord's Supper. And of course, what did Peter do? Uh, when they were in Gethsemane praying and the guards came to arrest Jesus. Understand Jesus preaches nonviolence. What does Peter do? Cuts off the ear of one of the guards with a sword. Duh. He's only had three years of instruction. You would think he might have caught on that that wasn't the route to go in order to be a follower of Jesus. He didn't quite get that. So, next thing he does on the day of crucifixion, uh, different times, three times, he's asked, hey, aren't you a guy, didn't you used to hang with that guy Jesus, up the one that's up there on the tree hanging there? Who, me? Oh, please. Me? I don't know that guy. So, you have then, a few days later, Peter going out, and what are you going to do once you lie? Okay, we, we've all lied. We all will know about lying and, and the impact that, that can have, uh, especially the big stuff, because usually you have to tell a second lie to cover up the first lie and then go on to the next lie to cover up and so on and so forth. And then pretty soon you lose friends because you don't want to see those people again because you know you're going to get caught, so then you start making some new friends. And if you keep on the same pattern of lying, you're going to end up with new friends all the time, new friends. You have to have new friends all the time because you're always going to get caught in the lies. And if you're a proud kind of person, you don't want to be found out and therefore punished by being found out. Uh, and uh, so what happened with Peter and these, and these six disciples, they were at, uh, at just at loose ends. They weren't sure what to do. I don't know if you've ever been at loose ends with your life. I suspect most of you have, as I have. Or you're just at loose, loose ends. There's nothing horribly wrong, but there's nothing real right. You're just sort of at loose ends. And so they decided that they would try to go back and do what they knew best, which is not at all uncommon. Uh, in their case, what they did, they went back to do what they do best. They went back to fish. But they found out that their heart really wasn't in it. Because they knew that really wasn't what it was all about anymore for not for them. They had changed over three years. And you can't go back and revisit three years and think it's going to be the same way. It never is. And so they ended up in a new place, new location, new destination. And brought the old with them and it didn't work for them. So they didn't catch any fish. And uh, then there's the guy on the beach. Got a little campfire going. Says, yo, hey guys. Throw the net out on the other side of the boat. And they're looking at him, the guy on the beach. And they're thinking, you know what they're thinking. <laughs> Who does he think he is? And what does he know that we don't? The guy's a loser. But what the heck? We sure haven't done anything good on this side of the boat, so we'll give it a shot. So they did, and they ended up catching 153 fish, which was a big load in a small net for that day. And at that point then, Peter recognizes Jesus as the guy on the shore. So he throws his clothes on, swims off to shore, 
and waits for the other disciples to show up with the catch of fish. And they do catch up, and they all get up there on the beach. And what's the first thing that they don't ask him? Who are you? And they don't ask him that because they knew it was the Lord. But you'll also notice one other thing. They didn't say, hi, Jesus. Nice to see you. Like I said, the last week for them had been walking around with handcuffs on. And it also handcuffed their tongues because they didn't know what to say. And they didn't quite know what to believe. So they were handcuffed. Now, within that context, Jesus decides to break the impasse and feeds them. And you'll notice the feeding with the fish and the bread certainly reminded them, as it does you, of Jesus' of feeding of the 5,000. Right? It also reminded them, because of the small group, of the Lord's Supper. Even though they were using fish and bread instead of wine and bread. And uh, so they have these things going on in their heads uh, as they're eating. And then Jesus has to do something with Peter. What do you do? No, I'm serious. What do you do with somebody who you really love, who's a complete screw up? Yeah, you keep loving them. You keep loving them. But by golly, it gets hard. Because the one who's done the screwing up knows he's been doing the screwing up. Knows it. And then what does that person do except get guilty? So you have a very guilty Peter there eating fish and bread. The other disciples, knowing it's Jesus, but afraid to say, hi, Jesus, because they don't want to raise any issues, you know? So, Jesus breaks the impasse and simply says to Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me as I love you? And Peter says, I filios you. I like you like a friend. <laughs> That's what it says. Okay, Peter, you like me like I'm a friend. Here's what I want you to do. Feed my lambs. Okay, see, by this time now Jesus recognizes guys living guilty. And he's got good reasons for living guilty. You know, he's beating himself bad. So Jesus needs to get the guy from beating himself up. And how do you do that but to begin to lead a person away from the beating up of yourself and away from it? Movement, pilgrim people, St. Peter calls us, pilgrim people. We're moving away from ourselves sometimes for the ugly part of us. So, first thing he does, Peter, I want you to feed my lambs. So, the very first thing, when you start to lose faith, when you start to lose hope, when you start to lose sight of Jesus in your life and uh, start to get victimized by the negativity in our culture, the very first thing you do is take a step to Jesus, which means to take care of somebody who legitimately needs some caring for. And that's what Jesus asked Peter to do. Didn't ask him to him. Feed my lambs. When you see somebody hungry, feed them. Doesn't say, I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe in my resurrection. Just says, Peter, it's time for first steps again. Baby steps. Feed somebody who's hungry. Help somebody who needs help. Second thing he does uh, is ask him the question again. Uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Uh, oh, by the way, you notice that uh, Jesus does not call Peter, Peter. Okay, he calls him by his given name. 
Why didn't he call him Peter? Peter's the name that Jesus gave him, the rock. Why make the guy feel worse about himself? Because he wasn't a very good rock. He stank. So he uses his given name and says, Simon, do you love me? Do you agape me? Simon again, what's he say? I love you like a friend. This time he says, tend my sheep. Which is another way of saying then, and every time you show leadership or help people with the direction of their lives or give them advice or helpfulness, that's tending, that's tending to somebody's life. So that's the second thing he does. First thing is take a baby step. Help somebody in a little way needs help. The second thing to move back toward God and your faith is to take a little bigger step where you're going to tend to people who have questions, who need a sense of direction, a sense of purpose with their lives. A mentor, in other words. And so that is what he says then to Peter. There's third times he asks him, do you agape me? Do you love me? fully and completely. And this time, Peter gets mad at him. <coughs> or Simon gets mad at him, rather. Says, Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you like a friend. <laughs> That's what he says again. And by golly, Jesus says, yeah, I know that you do love me like a friend. But here's what I want you to do. <coughs> I want you to feed my sheep. You'll notice it was feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and now feed my sheep. When he says, okay, you start with the baby step, then you take a little bigger step, and now you really take a step. And you step out with your shoulders back and your head up, and you feed and tend the people around you. And that means very simply, you do that in any way you have to do it for the sake of the people around you. You don't wuss around. You don't double think it, overthink it, confuse yourself. You just help where the help is called for, period, cut and dry. And through that means, that is how Simon will be restored to a rock-like faithful person of Jesus and a good leader because he's taken the necessary baby steps away from his own guilt and has started taking bigger, more adult steps in the way of helping and building lives. And you can see that then through the entire book of Acts, how Peter matures. You know, Peter was pretty much a racist. And at one point, he had to go to a Roman centurion's house, and he didn't want to go. But he had nightmares given to him. Thank you, Lord, for the nightmares. God gave him nightmares. Like we're talking like poisonous snake nightmares and dragon nightmares and like really ugly, I'm going to eat you, ugly nightmares, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so Peter had to go to that guy's house and found out that this Gentile really was not a very bad guy at all. <laughs> that they had a lot in common. So you see what happens. On the shore, Jesus is meeting the disciples again in the same way, but also in a new way. He's there in the flesh. He's acting as a servant like he did on the uh, nights when he started Holy Communion, washed their feet. This time he cooked them a meal. Uh, he's inviting them to start taking baby steps again in faith uh, and in trusting that that's the right thing to do, and they begin to do it. They take the baby steps, and then we'll start eventually to take the bigger steps. And that is how God then will meet you in your life. When your faith starts to get weak, when you're not sure exactly what you're doing with your faith or with your life, when you start to lose the uh, the joy and the presence of God in your daily living, it is then that Jesus will meet you in a new way. 
and will invite you to take baby steps and the baby steps will always be external to you. You'll notice all of these things Jesus says to Peter are external, right? Feed, tend, and tend. They're outside of himself because he's overthinking it. And then Peter's life, as you know, is restored, a life of faith. And that's true of the rest of the disciples. And uh, the promise that is made all of the time, as Luther said, <coughs> Where there is charity and love, there is God. And you see that pretty much in action in this gospel reading this morning. Uh, the 153 fish, uh, for those of you who really like conspiracy theories, I'm telling you, this is History Channel stuff, okay? I'll give you a hot tip. One times one times one. Five times five times five. Three times three times three. Add the add them up, each of the answers, and you will come up to guess what number? Uh huh. Now to really jazz it up, each of the Hebrew letters was assigned a number, and the letters and the numbers mean a certain phrase that appears in the Bible nine different times. No, I'm not going to tell you the phrase. No, you look it up yourself. You do a little homework. You're so darn lazy. <laughs> what I'm saying is, <laughs> there, is a, there is a certain numerology that's present in the Bible. Uh, and uh, and, you, and you can have some fun with it. But what's the master message of that 153 fish in the net? Nobody got away. And that really is the promise that the guys on the beach finally realized. God doesn't let anybody that he chooses get away. Any time that you know in your head and you think the word God, or Jesus, or Spirit, or love, or charity, or thank you, or care, or share, any of those words, grace, that's how you know you've been caught in God's net. So whether it was 153 or 163 is of little difference. It's simply this. You are all caught in God's net. And you belong to him. And yet, you can try to break away, but you're not going to get very far. Because it's not in you to be a wretched, miserable human being. You will always be brought back to your knowledge that God loves you. And that's because of Jesus and his death and resurrection. And that's the good news for all of us. We're part of the net. Amen.